Okay, so the first thing you want to do is open up the RMD file. So this is the file that we'll be working with in this workshop. If you want to view the PDF as well, that's just kind of a printout of what we're going to see in the RMD file. So you can use that for later or um, look at it on a different screen if it's helpful. But for now, we'll just click into this RMD and it will open up like this. Now, Ava, take it away from here. Yeah. Uh, the what now? Uh, this is this side? Nope, I got that. Yeah, that'll come later. Awesome. So when you open up RStudio, initially you're going to have those three separate screens, but when you do open up your RMD or script file, you'll have a fourth screen pop up and that is going to be your source window. This is where you're going to be directly kind of working with the code, running the code, editing it. And this is also what's going to be saved at the end of end of the workshop. Um, the console for script files will run the code that you run, but it won't actually save any work. So this is a great place to kind of fidget around with your results of your code and test things out. And then down in the right corner, we have the files, plots, packages, help window. This is where you're going to upload data. Um, my favorite way is just to go to these three little dots over here, and that's actually going to open your files tab for you. So you can really go in and find something that's a little lost in there. Um, as well as when we run our codes, we're going to create graphs. We see those under the plots. Uh, we can upload different packages with different data sets. And if you ever need help, we'll get into this later, but there is a help window as well. And then in the top right corner, we have an environment and history window. The environment is going to show you all your variables. So we'll get into that next. You can assign um, certain variables to certain numbers, and those are all going to appear in your environment tab. As well, you can import data sets under your environment tab. And then the other important thing here is history. And this is where you're going to see all your um, commands that you have run. So if you want to go back without having to retype something, you go to there to rerun it. And then just a few things, general uh, intro to RStudio. This little, what is that figure called? Carrot. <laughs> a carrot. This carrot indicates that um, RStudio is ready to take commands. If it wasn't, there you'd see a plus sign and that's indicating that it needs additional instruction on what to do. And then, just another thing I like to show intro in the intro class is whoop, if you type question mark and then any command, it will show you what it will pull up exactly what that command does. So if you ever are confused on something and want to check it out real quick, that is a great way to quickly figure out what a command is. Um, and then something else that is awesome with our studio is that it can be really, you can really tailor it to what you want um, aesthetically. And so if you go down under tools to global options and under appearance, you can change the font, you can change the size of the font, and you can also change um, kind of just the colors of it, which can help with the contrast. So. That is the appearance. And as well under that, you can change the paint and layout if you'd like to work differently with the windows. If So you can really adjust it to however best fits your needs. And that is all I have. Okay, I haven't taught in a while, so I'll try and make sure I hit everything. So I'm sure Greta or Sarah, you can jump in if I miss something. Um, so um, this is our markdown file that um, it includes both code and um, documentation. So this is code we run, and then this is just text um, where we can, um, you know, put notes or um, have output. Let's see. So we just went over this and then let's see. 
Okay. So um, here we have our first code chunk. Um, and this is just like simple uh, operations. So you can either run this by putting your cursor on the line and doing uh, control enter. Yes, control enter. You can also highlight it and do control enter. So um, those are two ways to run it, or you can push the play button. We'll run everything in the code chunk. You can see you're getting output here. Um, you can also put these commands directly in the console down here. Um, so you can do like one plus two and it gives you three, but then this is not saved. Like if you have it written down in the code chunk, which is good for reproducibility. Um, so, um, so that's basic just operations you can do, um, addition, um, multiplication. This is a square root function. Um, and then more likely you'll be creating objects using R. Um, and so we do that with this assignment arrow. Um, so we always have the name of our object to the left and whatever value we're giving it to the right. Um, and when we run that, do we have a code chunk? Um, so if we run that, that now appears in our environment. So we have object X has a value of six. Um, and some notes about creating objects in R. Um, uh, you can also use the equal sign to do the same thing, um, but sometimes that syntax is confusing. So we just default to always using this um, arrow operator. Um, and some notes about the objects are that they are case sensitive. So if I do um, a capital X equals five, um, those are two different things. And if you don't have a capital X and you try to call a capital X, it'll say it doesn't exist. Um, and then uh, something else you should try to do is have the names be um, explanatory for what you're uh, using it for. So here it's just the letter X, but maybe you want something called temp for temperature, um, for example. Um, so that's more descriptive and you know what that's for, what that value is. Um, you can also use, um, you know, current temperature versus current temp, sometimes shortening it makes it a little bit easier to use while still being a, um, a good name for the object. Um, and you can't start objects with a number. Uh, it has to start with letters, but you can end or include numbers in the name. Um, just make sure it's useful information, because if you have something like clean data two, what is two? Um, is it different than one, et cetera? Um, right, so, and you can't use any other punctuation. You can use um, periods and underscores in your names, um, but we don't recommend using periods, so often just underscores if you need to have like a longer name. Um, and then lastly, you don't usually want to use um, R has different functions that perform operations on values like mean SD for standard de deviation. So you probably avoid using function names as your object names because um, that can um, maybe overwrite things or not do what you expected it, it would get confusing. Um, so avoid that. Um, okay. And now we're going to go on to working with the object. So I sort of already put this in here. So we've got um, X here. We have six stored under X, which I've already run and it's in our environment. Um, the other thing is when you do that, all it does is store it. Um, and you can see what X is by actually typing out the name of that object and running it. So here running X gives us six because um, that's the value that's stored under X. Um, and then, so once that's stored, you can use it in different operations. So um, X times, or 2.2 .2 times X, it pulls up that value of six, gives us 13.2, uh, four plus X gives us 10, um, so on. Um, and then once you have an object, you can always overwrite it. So first we'll uh, use, X in an operation and store it as an object. So X plus six, and we're storing that under Y. 
We can see that in the environment. Uh, but now we can go in and store two under X. So that updates the value of X to two here. Um, so just as the first exercise, um, what is the current value of Y? Uh, 12 or eight? Anybody? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's a good guess. So we updated. It's not eight, even though we updated the value of X. Um, we ran this operation storing it under Y, uh, before that. So it's still stored as 12. Uh, X is now two, but if we run this again, now it's eight and you can always check that over in the environment. Um, or you can do that by running Y and checking the current value. So um, just to practice, make sure you know what you're working with and you know what your objects are stored as or your values. Um, so, uh, so now we're gonna go into different types of data. These have all been just um, numeric values so far. Um, we can store multiple values under an object um, and that's called a vector. Um, and we create vectors by putting in multiple values with this C um, parentheses uh, function for concatenate, and it sticks all of those items together. So here we have C and then a few different values, and we're going to store that under temps. So run that and then check what we've stored under temps by running just the name. And you can see that it pulls up um, these values that we've put in. Uh, so this is a vector of numeric values. Uh, we can also do that with character values or character strings. Um, so here we have a few different character strings. These are different than objects because they have parentheses. Um, so like animals is an object without parentheses. Cat is a character string because it has parentheses. And we have a few of those. And we can store those in a vector then check what's under animals. And there's the four character strings in that vector. Um, and so those are some different data types stored in the vector. Um, and we can always check what type of vector it is. Um, so we can either do that by again, looking in the environment. So animals has this CHR for character, temps has NUM for numbers. Um, and we can use the class function to check any object. So when we run it on temps, it's numeric. Run it on animals and it's character. Um, so another exercise. Um, so now you guys create your own object called uh, DES, D-E-C, and have it contain three decimal value numbers. So um, like 3.4 or something like that. Um, so create that vector. And then uh, try and check what, after you've created it, check what type of uh, type of vector it is, uh, just like we did above. Figure it out. Okay. okay. You guys tried doing that? Okay. Oh, got it. Okay. Um, so, uh, just to go over how to do that, um, we've got DEC, we've got our assignment arrow, and then we've got our, um, concatenation to make a vector. And then in there, we've got three different values, um, with decimals and I'm just going to run that. You can see that appears in our environment. Um, and now we're going to run the function class on that object to check what type it is and it's numeric. Um, and then 
you also notice that this one number I didn't give a decimal and because the others are decimals it still appears as 3.0 um, okay Sure, she knows how to do this. <laughs> we're just having trouble navigating to the files. So we need to extract that. Did that put it in? <laughs> I was pacing. Should I slow down? No, I think yeah, there's a lot of information. <laughs> yeah, this is, I feel like a lot of the intro class is learning how to use our studio, learning yeah. how to get everything in. So this yeah. is all part of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can check what line we're on to figure out where we're at, and you can also. So it's not exactly. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so approximate line numbers, and then there's also this outline button I like using to like pick what section you're in. <laughs> oh, that's so good. <laughs> I love that outline. Exercise three. Exercise two. Oh, yeah. So you can jump to exercise two. Good to keep going. Okay. Um, so uh, we've done character vectors, numeric vectors, including with decimal points. And then there's also another type, um, logical vectors or values um, or Boolean. Um, so these are values that take on true or false, um, but they're actually not stored as true or false or characters are stored as numbers. So if you were to give true or false a number, what would you guys give it? If you needed yeah, true or false. Science person here, so. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I wanted to know which is which. Yeah, yep, exactly. Um, so you can code it in all caps here as true and it shows up as blue. Um, so it's a value, but underneath that it's stored as zeros and ones. Um, so here we're just going to create an object called logic uh, and that appears here and the type is logi, uh, which we can check with the class and it's a logical vector. Um, so now that we have these data types, um, what happens if we try to store multiple types of values in a single vector? Um, uh, we can just try this out. So um, here we've got a few numbers and a character at the end. So when we run that and check what's stored there, um, what happens is we have our character vector, but it also stored the rest of our numbers as characters as well. So those have, um, it says one, but it has the quotations around it. So it's saying it's a character string. Um, and you can check that here, num jar is a character vector. Uh, so now we have some numbers and a false value. And here's where you can see it's stored actually as a zero. So these are all numbers. 
and false is turned into a zero um, or coded as a zero. Um, now we have characters with a true um, and with characters, we've got our ABC and now true is stored as a character vector. Um, and then we're going to do a few numbers and then a four in quotation marks. Anybody have an idea of what will happen here? Just. Yep. Yep. So, uh, because there's one character vector, it turns all the rest into character vectors, just like this 1st 1, even though it is a number in a character form. Um, so this kind of shows that there is, um, the different types of data are coerced into a single data type in a vector. Um, and there's sort of a hierarchy where if you have a character vector, everything else becomes characters. If you have, um, let's see, if you have numbers, um, uh, it'll turn logical values into numbers, and then you will only have a logical vector if it's only true falses. So that's sort of at the bottom of the hierarchy. Okay, um, so that's vectors, and we also have another data type that gets a little uh, more complicated called lists. So lists are nice if you want multiple data types uh, stored in the same object. Vectors, you can have one data type. Um, so um, here, this first line, we're using list to create our list instead of C to create a vector. And then we're pulling in three objects that we've already created um, uh, up above. And they're all different types. So temps was numeric, logic was logical, and animals was character. So three different data types, and we're storing those in a list. So we'll run that. And then taking a look, um, we can see this first one, uh, this first element in here um, is all of our character strings. Second is our numeric elements. And then uh, lastly is our true falses. Um, so you can store multiple data types. And then if you wanna pull out one of these, you start, um, you use these square brackets. So double square brackets and a one, you can see that it's labeled here. Um, when you run that, it just pulls out that first um, indexed part of the list. So that pulls out just this vector, and now this behaves just as your regular vector that was stored in there. Um, so, let's see. Um, yeah, so this, this can get confusing, and an easy way to think about it, or an easier way to think about it is lists are like shelves, or like a bookshelf. Um, and we've got a graphic here kind of showing this. So you've got your entire bookshelf and each shelf on here, um, like uh, one, two, three is a shelf, a string is a shelf. Uh, those are within your bookshelf or list. And then on each shelf, there's a number of different um, items. And so you have the same type of item on a shelf, but you can have multiple types of shelves. Um, so this is just showing different ways you can pull that out. Um, if you use in this second part of the image, if you use single brackets, it's, it knows that you're still talking about this entire shelf um, and you can pull out um, the top uh, one and two rows or the fourth row. Um, if you start using the double brackets, it removes that shelf completely. So now it just views this as its own shelf, not the whole bookshelf. Um, and then from there, you can pull out an item from there. So adding on, so you've got double brackets for which shelf and single brackets for which item on the shelf. Um, and then, I don't know, if more brackets is usually better. I don't know, Greta, if you wanna clarify any of this, this is the tricky part. <laughs> um, so the, the point here is that um, the shelf is that when an item, you see lots of brackets going on in somebody else's code, it's just trying to get at a specific item or a specific list within a larger list. Um, this is very complicated, so we're going to go to the next section and <laughs> make it a lot easier to access value. Um, so. Yes, yep. So that's confusing because there's, um, you know, numbers for the shelves, number for the items. So we can also name the list. So we've got our list again. Um, but now we're going to call the shelves title, 
numbers and data. Um, and we've got different things stored under each of those with the equal sign. So we'll go ahead and run that. And now when we look at it, it simplifies it a little bit. This one, the shelf is title, numbers, data. Um, and it doesn't use the double brackets anymore. It uses a dollar sign. Um, so you can call that um, if you want to pull off something instead of using all the brackets, you can just do title, for example, and it'll just pull off that part. So that simplifies it a little bit. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, we're good. <laughs> that puts a lot. Yeah, there's, um, there's any questions or? Yeah. <laughs> Um, or we can go back if it's not, if parts are not clear. Um, so next we're gonna jump into probably the most, um, what you'll use most often is importing data sets. Um, so you might have an Excel file where you've stored a bunch of data and we wanna pull that into R to start using it and doing analysis or data wrangling. Um, so we can do that with the import data set button, which is up here um, in your environment tab. Um, and then we do from text, which you can choose different options depending on your data. But here we've got from text and then I don't know. Uh, uh, should I just skip that part? Okay. Um, so you can select your data set in there. Um, you can also, uh, so this is like your folder where you have your current uh, our markdown file, you can also right click. Uh, no, there's another way to do regular. regular click. Ah, yes, regular click and import data set. Um, so we're going to open our blackfootfish.csv data file um, and you pull that up and it gives you a preview of the data and what data types it's anticipating that uh, this is. And there's a. Uh, so the string is factors button in here. Um, it doesn't look like it. It's it's the read underscore CSV source. Oh, that's okay. Okay. Um, and then if that looks good, you can just click import. And when you do that, it'll bring up the object that you've just imported. Um, you can see that it's in your environment right here. Um, it also gives you the code in your console. So this is the actual code it ran. You can do it point and click, but then um, this is what it actually used. It used the package called read r and read underscore CSV. So you can copy this into your markdown. Um, So you can have this now, and whenever you run this, it'll perform that same operation without the pointing and the point and click options. Um, read.csv is base R uh, function. So you can just run that or read underscore CSV is from um, this other package, but they do the same thing. Okay. Um, and if you don't have the file, we also include in here, we have this file hosted on GitHub that you can just directly read that from the online repository. Um, is everybody able to load their data set? Yep. Okay. Um, so um, going back to this is sort of a new format of data. Um, what uh, object class is this? We can run our class function on the, the name of it that we gave this Blackfoot fish. Um, wait. Okay. Um, forget what these other parts are. So, oh, because it used read R. Okay. Yeah, the fancy version. Okay. This is the base R version, read.csv. Um, okay. And the class type is a data frame. Um, we can use dim to find the number of dimensions. So it gives you two values. Uh, the first is the number of rows and the second is the number of columns. Um, names, 
uh, gives you this vector of character strings, and these are the names of the columns or the variables in the data. So when it pulled up this object here, you could see that these are all the columns and these are the names of them. Um, and then STR structure gives you a bit of information. So it tells you it's a data frame. It tells you how many observations or rows there are, how many variables or columns there are, and then the names of each of those columns, the um, type of value in that column, and then the first few values. So you can see an example of what's stored in there. Um, so that one's useful. Um, another way to look at the data um, using summary. Uh, running this on your data set gives you a quick summary. Um, descriptive statistics, minimum, maximum, the first and third quartiles, and the mean and median, if it is a uh, numeric variable. Um, if it's a character, it'll just tell you how many rows there are and that it's a character variable. And also if there's any NAs like this weight variable. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of ways to sort of inspect your data once you've uh, imported it, which is good to make sure, you know, um, that you, you're getting what you expect and it didn't import something in a weird way or you don't have missing data. Um, so uh, you can look at the size with these different functions, dimension, number of rows, number of columns. Length is the length of a vector, um, which you can pull out a column um, and find the length of that. Um, you can check what's stored in there with head or tail or view. Head and tail give you the values in the first, first six or last six rows. Uh, view just pulls up this extra little tab so you can see the whole thing. Uh, names, um, we can do column names or row names. Um, and then some summaries of the data itself. So STR, like we saw, um, gives you information about the structure. Uh, Glimpse is similar to that. Um, it's a little bit fancier and it requires, uh, it's not base R, it requires this Tibble package. Um, and then summary we tried uh, already and that gives you the summary statistics. Um, and these are also generic functions. So they work on other data types um, besides uh, data frames. So like vectors, lists, stuff like that most of the time. Um, so going into data frames um, and how to work with them, um, as I mentioned that they're stored in rows and columns. So variables in the columns and rows are, um, each row is a different observation. Um, so I think, are these fish? Is that, okay. So this would be like fish number one, it's on trip one, mark zero, length 288, et cetera. Um, uh, columns are basically vectors. And so within a column, you can only have one data type. So it has to be numeric or character, uh, but you can have multiple types of columns within a data frame. Mm. Uh, let's see. Okay. And if we want to extract information from just one column, we go back to using a dollar sign, kind of like we did with the lists or named lists. So um, if we take the name of the data frame we have here, Blackfoot fish, and then dollar sign year, year is one of the variables, we can store that into an object called years, run that. Um, and then if you just run uh, the, the year's object to see what it looks like, it prints out everything, but uh, notice once you pull out that column, it, this is just a vector of numbers. And then we can check that when we run STR on that object we created from the column. So it's an integer uh, vector. It goes from one to 18,352. So that's the length of it. Um, and here's the first values in there. So, so far they're all 1989. Um, so uh, going back to this question, how would you determine the length of it? Um, 
it, you can tell it from structure. It gives you how many different uh, elements it goes to. You can also use length and that object that we pulled out. And that gives you the length of the vector. Okay. Um, uh, so other ways to pull out information from your data frame. Um, we can use, um, let's see, go up here. Um, it also tells you the dimensions up here. You can expand that to look at the variables. Um, and if we want to pull out um, parts of the data frame, like a column or a series of rows, um, we can use brackets again. And this type of brackets we have for a data frame, data frames have rows and columns. So you have uh, square brackets, uh, a row number, comma, and then a column number. And so you can put whatever values you want in the row position or the column position to pull that out. So um, if we run this Blackfoot fish one comma five, it will pull out row one, column five, which we can see here, row one, two, three, four, five. And so it's pulling out this value and it just gives us that single value. Um, let's see. Okay. So now we're gonna practice working with this a few different exercises. Um, so this part, we're just creating sort of a new small data frame to play with. Um, so I'll run that. Um, and we can see here that it has uh, columns X, Y, and Z, and it has five rows um, with different values stored under each column, um, characters and numbers. Um, so what do you guys think would happen if you entered um, three comma blank to pull out information from this data frame? Uh, yeah, good guess. Okay, so we've got three in the rows position. So row one, two, three. So it might pull out T, but um, because there's nothing in the columns position, what it actually does, um, we'll just write that in here. So row three, it actually pulls out everything in there. So, um, the entire row, not just the first column, because we didn't specify which column. So good guess, that's um, the right idea. And um, I'll let you guys try this part on your own. Um, I'll create I'll how this make a code show. Okay, uh, I'm trying to remember, there's a shortcut to do it on your keyboard. So it's control alt I. If you're on a Mac, I think it's command option I, or if you go up here to the top, um, there's this little green square and you can insert an R code chunk. There's different types you can enter, but we're only using R. So you can also um, do this and it'll create this code chunk for you to run. Um, so you can create a code chunk and then um, try and think of a way using this uh, bracket notation to pull out the number 2015 from this data frame that we made. So this value. Okay, um, anybody figure it out? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so one way you can do it is, since this is a small data frame and we know we want 2015, this is row two, column three. So let's try row two, comma, column three. And then we just get our single value of 2015 pulled out. Uh, I'm trying to think of the other way that says, think of two ways to do it. Um, Oh, yeah, there's another way going back to how you pull columns out or named lists. Another hint. You got it? Well, you can pull out the column name and the second index. Yeah, exactly. So this is um, often an easier way to do it, but it takes a little more thinking. So we have our data frame and we want to pull out column Z because it's in that column. 
Um, so if we did only that, it would give us all these values. And then on top of that, we can um, pull out the second one, the second item in that vector. Uh, there we go. And so now we just get 2015. So this is another way you can do it. Um, okay. All right. Um, okay, so uh, if you have a lot of data and you're putting in all these numbers, it can get confusing, especially if you wanna pull out multiple things, not just one item. Um, so you can list out multiple items in the data set you wanna pull out. Um, and it's especially useful if those items are next to each other. So um, we can create a list of things to pull out with this uh, um, concatenate create a vector thing again. So um, going back to this, this pulled out uh, row two, column three, and that was just one item. We can pull out multiple ones by listing them. So here we wanna pull out row one and two, column three, and you can pull out multiple um, elements from the data frame. And since one and two are next to each other, you can actually just use a colon and it says pull out items from one to two in, in column three. Um, and you can expand that to anything that's adjacent. So pull out one through four in column three. Um, so um, we can try out uh, how this a colon operator works where here we have a list of one, two, three, four, five, and you can just shortcut that by using one colon five. Gives you the exact same thing, but you don't have to list out everything in between. Um, and if you do five to one, it lists it in reverse order. Um, and you can use large numbers. This is from 123 to 131, and it gives you everything in between. Um, and this is going from three to negative one. So it lists out all of that, including zero. So um, this colon A colon B notation is really convenient. Um, when you have things that are not adjacent, like say here, you wanna pull out items one, three, and nine, you just have to list them out. <laughs> um, so let's see. Yeah, this is just another example like I just showed. So here, uh, nothing in the column, so all columns, and we just wanna pull out rows two and three. And this is what it gives us. Um, on the other hand, we want rows two and four. They're not next to each other. We have to list them out. And here's what we get what we want, but we have to tell it explicitly, whereas here we can also do this with a colon. Um, okay, so let's practice that. Um, here, create a code chunk again. Um, so try and type out um, on your own how you would get columns X and Y and how you would get off columns X and Z by themselves. Many ways to do it. True. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you get the right answer, it doesn't have to tell you. Yes. Okay. Um, so hopefully you had a quick chance to think about that. Um, so columns X and Y are um, the first two columns. So you could do um, all rows, blank, comma, and then um, columns one through two, and that gives you columns X and Y. And then you could do the same thing with um, X and Z are not next to each other. So do all rows, comma, and then list out columns one and three. 
So there you get X and Z by themselves. Um, trying to think, I should name them. We haven't quite talked about that. It's coming up. Um, so instead of the column number, you can give it the column name. So column X and Y, I think that's what I need. Yep. So instead of picking the number, you can also name the column and it'll pull it out. Yeah. Okay. Couple more exercises. Um, so we want to get an output. Um, we have this vector here of numbers and we want the output to be 22 and then 24. Um, so you can try doing that. It gives you a hint with what to start with. Okay, so I'm going to try, um, you call the vector and then you use brackets to pick what you want to pull out of it. And I want um, 22, 24 next to each other so I can do one through two, the first two um, elements in that vector. Uh, could also list them out individually. Okay. Um, so that's how you can do the same thing with a vector instead of a data frame. Um, so to differentiate, try running this um, piece of code right here. So it's S uh, brackets and then it's three comma blank. So we would think it would pull out, we've got S our vector that we defined right here. Um, and we would think it'd pull out row three in all columns. So what would that actually do? We run that and we get an error, incorrect number of dimensions. And the reason for that is because S is a vector. It's a data frame or it's not a data frame. It doesn't have rows and columns, so you can't tell it which row and column. Um, so that's where that error is trying to tell us. So um, we can't give it that comma. We can only pull out um, certain idle or certain elements in the vector. Um, so we just go to a regular bracket without that comma. And we get the third element, 49. Um, okay. Is this your section or? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of information. So hopefully it's, yeah, different data types and how to pull things out of it. So let's do like five minute break. Come back at the top of the hour. Seven minute break. <laughs> and if you have any questions or, um, Oh, I have one. Oh, no, that's us. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and your address. All right. I've paused my sharing. Oh. And because I lost that controls, I can't stop the um audio. So <laughs> it's okay. You can't? Um I like took over. No, no, no. It's because I, I tried to hide the um the WebEx controls so that um, they were out of the way. Um maybe I'll mute you. Yeah. What if I can't unmute you? you Oh, um, yeah, don't worry about yeah, it. It's fine. I think you have to. Sorry, I, I just did it too. So maybe it's not me. <laughs> I'm just going to stop my sharing and then I will restart it.
Um, we're a little ahead, but is Samantha there? We're all here. Uh, let me check. She said, no worries. Oh, perfect. All right, so let's, let's go ahead and um, continue on. So um, uh, we've got a computer science person here, um, which I don't know if you guys cover this anymore in, in computer science classes. We're gonna talk a little bit about historical use of data storage. Um, this actually is still used a lot in certain fields. Um, so when we import data, um, Sally kind of mentioned, we want to make sure that um, we import it in a way so that um, strings or characters are not converted into factors. We want to make sure that we do that deliberately. And so um, read.csv and read.table have an argument that's called strings as factors. We want to make sure that that's set as false. Um, sometimes when we import it, it's automatically set as false and we have to actually deliberately change that. Um, and we want to do that because we want to be, um, we don't want it to convert all of our characters to factors automatically. Uh, we want to make sure that we know exactly what it's doing. So what is a factor? Um, a factor variable is a numeric representation of a character variable. It used to be that if you had a character variable that had less than 256 different unique strings, that you could convert that into a number, and that made um, storing that variable um, take up a lot less space. Um, and nowadays, space is not really a concern, but the nice thing about when we have things stored as numbers we can do numerical operations on it, even if we shouldn't, um, but sometimes that makes sense. So if you're on um, a Likert scale, um, you know, where you're, you're going from strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree, um, we could store that as, as numbers and it sort of makes sense to think of an average rating, right? And so you can take an average of the numbers from one to five, but you can't take an average of characters like strongly disagreed and strongly agree. Um, an average doesn't make sense of that. And so can, uh, not just saving um, storage, but being able to do numeric operations on it will sometimes make sense. There are certain functions in R that require storing things as factors because we wanna make sure that there are a limited number of categories or a small number of categories, and we want them to be in an ordered way um, so that we could plot them, for example. Um, and again, there are some functions that still require that and some that don't, and sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. But when we talk about factors, we're thinking about, there's still characters, they just have a numeric representation of what the strings are. So let's see an example of that. Maybe it'll make a little bit more sense. Um, so in our, our um, fish data set, there are four different species, RBT for rainbow trout, um, WCT for West Slope cutthroat trout, um, bull trout and brown trout. And um, West Slope cutthroat trout is a mouthful. Um, and I don't know if you guys are locals or not, but for a brief minute, Gallatin High School was going to go with West Slope Cutthroat Trout as their mascot. And I was adamantly against that, even though my kids don't go there or won't go there, but that is just, that is just really annoying to say. <laughs> and so we're just gonna abbreviate it with WCT. Um, and notice that these are just kind of in um, a random order. Maybe this order made sense to the researcher. Um, but it's not in any particular order. Uh, and that might be the prioritization that we want to consider, or maybe we want to go with a different order. But let's see what happens when we look at or use the unique function to see how many different unique values or unique species that we have in um, this um, function. And I'm actually going to go ahead and minimize the console because from right now, we're just going to be working in the markdown file. Okay, so we can see that it actually the unique comes back in that same order that um, we have in this list. And um, it's probably pulling out the unique because that's the order in which it occurs or it encounters a new value in that list. 
So now we're going to create a factor variable um, of those string variables. And uh, we're, we want to make sure that we keep both um, the original vector and the modified vector so that we can go back if we change our mind or we want to redo things. And so this factor function is going to make this a numeric representation. And um, we can create a new variable in the same data frame by specifying the data frame name, dollar sign, and then our new variable name. And let's see what happens when we do that. And now um, in our console over here, we can see this new variable species F and it does identify it as a factor with four levels. And if I hover over it, we can see two levels, brown and bull, and we can see a bunch of threes. Um, okay, so when we looked at the unique value, it, RBT was first. Um, but when we created it as a factor, now brown is first. And um, so let's look at um, what are actually the levels of this new variable. So the levels is a function. And levels blackfoot fish. And I'm going to use tab complete so that I don't have too many typos. I want species F. And now the order is brown, bull, RBT, WCT. Um, what is determining this order? If before it was order of encountering a new value, what's the new ordering scheme? As a librarian, I would say alphabetical. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. R loves alphabetical. <laughs> and so when it can, it likes to put things in alphabetical order. Um, and, but maybe we don't want it in the order of occurrence um, or alphabetical. We want to specify our own order. Um, and we can actually do that by putting in a new parameter into this function. So before we were just using functions um, and we weren't really specifying any additional information. Uh, but now we're going to add a new parameter, which is going to give more information to that function. So we're separating our vector. Um, or the object that we're operating on with a comma and the parameter name is levels um, equals. And then we're going to give it a concatenated list um, of the order that we want. And we need to make sure that this list is the same length as the number of, of unique observations or unique values. So now if we do this. And we hover over um, in our console. Now we can see it still has four levels, but now bull is listed before brown. Um, and then we still see a bunch of threes because the first um, um, so many observations that we see are rainbow on the trout. Yes. So previously when we created a cell where we could put R code, it just said R at the top, but right now it says R tidy. Yeah. So it when um, good question. Um, so Back up here, uh, this one says factors. So this is a named cell. Um, and so we could um, down here in this chunk where it says chunk 30, now it says factors. So that gives that chunk a name. And so if we are looking in this list, that would be uh, one way to jump around in the data set. Um, and uh, the outline also works. Uh, the other parts here are what it looks like when you compile it to a finished document, either to a PDF or a word file or HTML. Um, this is, um, I don't really use Perl too much. Uh, it's just a way of cleaning up the code and um, this tidy equals false. If you, if tidy equals true, um, it's going to try to make sure and um, clean up any extra uh, information or lay it out in a way that it will all fit on a page. And so it's just, it's more of how it looks when you, when you compile the document to a final PDF form. That's a great question. And R here uh, indicates the type of code. So if we wanted to do this with Python, uh, we would need to install a bunch of packages, but we could put Python in there and then we would run Python code. Uh, great question. Okay, so now um, we uh, changed the um, order of the levels so we could rerun that levels function. I'm just going to copy and paste it from above. 
And now we can see that it's just bull and brown are just switching places because that's what we specified. Oh, and I sometimes I forget that I um, already have it written down and I jump around. Uh, so let's actually have you guys practice working with factor variables. So years are numeric, right? But we can also think of them as discrete values. We might want to treat them. Um, so, for instance, uh, if if it's a quantitative val value, um, we you know, like on a number line, you could put years on a number line. We could get a histogram. We'll look at histograms in a little bit um, when Sarah takes over. Uh, that if years are strings, then we can have bar charts and have a little bit of separation between our years, and maybe we want that instead. And so we need to be able to go back and forth between um, years as numbers and years as factors. So this next exercise is taking um, a, a, a variable that sort of makes sense to think of it as a number and turn it into a factor. Um, so it is. Uh, the code itself is our um, should have been removed, and that was one that I didn't catch <laughs> removing it. So the code is already there, so you just need to run it. And maybe after you, uh, well, and um, now we want to verify that year F is viewed as a categorical variable with the same levels as year. Um, so let's just check um, how do we um verify the type of a variable type of and it's actually um factor variables are stored as integers which uh, i explained is a way to save some space so it's not actually stored as categorical um, but we could, we want to make sure it has still the same information. Um, so we can look at the head of this new variable. And we can see that it's actually um, 1989 uh, and so on. And the levels are that. Um, and we can pull out the levels specifically using the levels function. And we can see that the levels are in quotation marks, so they are thinking of it as strings. And we can also look at the unique values in our factor variable, and it should be the same information that we got from levels. Uh, the reason why we like to have two copies, a factor version and the original version, is in case we want to go back to the original version. Uh, so we're going to do this again. Um, uh, you don't technically have to rerun this. It's just going to be the same that we did before. So we're going to create a year, turn year into a factor variable. And now let's say we want to go back to a number. We can use this as numeric function to take the factor variable and return it to a number. So we're going to call this uh, object year underscore recover. We're going to try to recover it as a numeric variable. And um, Let's look and we're going to create a data frame that combines the original um, factor version and then the recovered factor version. And so this data frame is now going to have two columns original and recovered. Original is going to be the year, uh, Blackfoot fish year F variable, and recovered is the year underscore recovered variable. And we can look at the head of this new data set and the tail of the new data set. And I'm going to run the whole chunk so that we can see both of those on two different tabs. So why did 1989 turn into a 1 and 1991 turn into a 3? Yeah. 1989 is the first year that we can observe in the data set in 1991 is this year? Yep, exactly. So we can't, um, when we turn it in, we turn a factor variable into a numeric variable, it's using that integer coding 
um, based on the alphabetical order of all of this um, different unique values that it has. And, um, and it's turning that into a number rather than the original value. Um, so that's why we want to make sure we have two copies that keep the original version around and then um, keep a copy that we turn into a factor variable. Um, and so if we were to average the recovered, we would get an average between one and, and um, however many years there are 10, 20. Um, and then, um, but that doesn't, that's kind of meaningless until we think about the um, the first year that we start from, we would have to add that to um, 1989. Um, so be very careful about using factors and going back, but you can move back and forth as long as you um, just keep in mind that you're turning this into integers that start with one. All right, packages. R in Python, um, the next workshop, workshop that we do is going to be introduction to Python. Um, in many other software programs have add on packages that give you um, enhanced functionality. Um, we've been so far working mostly in base R and so everything that comes with R uh, by default, but we can get a lot more functionality by installing packages. Um, there are um, there's. The tidy way of um, coding, um, which involves interacting with data frames more in an SQLite um, or data frame database way. Um, we'll talk about that in um, data visualization workshop and data wrangling workshop. Uh, and so that's that's a whole different way of working with R and R Studio. But there are other smaller packages that do um, little bits and pieces that you, we might want to um, change. Um, and so we're not really going to get into that too much other than to talk about how to get all these packages. Um, so in the packages tab, you can see that in my day to day, um, I have lots of different kinds of packages that I need to work with and I upgraded R to a new um, dot version. Um, so it meant that I needed to reinstall all of my packages. If you do an incremental incre um, incremental version, then um, you don't have to reinstall packages. So what I mean here is that um, if I went to 4.4.2, I don't need to reinstall packages. I might need to update them. If I go from 4.4 to 4.5, and those major dot releases happen once or twice a year, usually twice a year, um, then you have to um, up, it, reinstall all of your packages because that usually means that all the packages had had major changes as well. Um, just a side note, they always name their versions um, based off of the cartoon strip uh, peanuts. So any um, some of them uh, don't make a lot of sense, but they're just out of peanuts. And I don't know if they randomly pick them or if they deliberately pick them, but that's what happens. So, uh, to get packages, we would go to um, the packages tab and install. And we can put in, um, let me scroll down a little bit. Let's see, um, let's, we can put in more than one package at a time using commas and we don't need to add spaces. Uh, we could do a space and a comma. So we could uh, type in remotes and then comma tidyverse. And then we could hit install. We want to make sure that install dependencies is checked and it'll tell you where it's going to put those packages. Um, sometimes it's important or sometimes if there's issues, you can go to that location and manually delete a, a package that's having problems updating and then it'll, um, just reinstall it from scratch. Uh, you can also, um, so after you install a package, then we'll load it. Uh, before we do that, we can um, check for updates and I probably, I do have a lot of updates. Um, sometimes I have problems when I select all of these packages and try to update them all at once. Um, usually what I'll try to do is update as many of them as I can and then go through and figure out which ones won't update um, automatically. Um, after you have a package installed, so 
That's like asking your local library to buy a new book. MSU library, will you buy this new book? Okay, yes. <laughs> the library has the new book. Now you want to actually be able to access that book, right? You have to go into the library and check it out. So once the library has that book, then you can ask for it to be checked out by using the library function. And um, so when you run this, and you'll get all sorts of messages the first time you run it saying, uh, which other package dependencies that it is checking out at the same time. And if two packages have the same function, it'll tell you which package is taking priority. So, for instance, dplyr has a function called filter, and that's taking priority over the base R stats package's filter version. Um, and uh, you can um, make those become errors instead of just overwriting, overwriting them, but generally it's fine to let the conflicts do what they're going to do. Okay. Um, when act, if you run this again, you're not going to get that output. Those messages only come the first time that you check that library book out. So I go into the library and say, I want to check out this book. And the library says, you've already got that book checked out. You can't check it out again. Um, all right. And Ava mentioned briefly finding help. There's lots of different ways to find help. Um, you can ask chat GPT. Um, which, you know, the help is either going to be good or not. Um, you can ask the help tab. So here I've typed in help for bar plot. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Um, and it gives you all sorts of information about how to use it, the uh, parameters that are involved with that function, um, detailed information about all the arguments. And then if you go down to the bottom, it um, will each function is supposed to give you some examples. If you run the examples, it will run everything that's in there and it'll give you output. So the examples by the, in the help file doesn't have any output, but if you run the examples, it'll um, give you that output. The other thing that you can do, if I go back, is you can copy any, anything that's in um, the help examples, you can copy and paste into the console and run it from there. And now that plot will go into the um, plots tab. Another way to get help, um, again, is the question mark in whatever function you want. And um, a list of all the different functions that have mean in the name will come up. So sometimes it becomes a little bit tr tricky um, if it's a common name. Uh, and then you can um, just select one. If you hit enter, then that will bring up um, mean, means arithmetic, arithmetic mean. Um, and um, if you really want it to give you some help for something that might not be an exact match, you can do a double question mark. So, um, double question mark on uh, all of, and let's put this in quotes. And it will give us all sorts of search results that have anything to do with all of, and there's going to be lots of functions that have that in there. Um, in front is the package that the function is going to come from. And you can hover over it and it'll tell you a little bit of about each a little bit more detail than just what it has here listed out. I also like to go to the packages tab and you can if you know that something is in a particular package, um, such as in the evaluate tab, um, it will tell you all the help pages that are part of that package and then you can click on. Um, replay and it'll give you the help for the replay function. All right, any questions about packages or getting help? Fortunately, um, AI is 
generally pretty good about giving help for coding things. Um, but what we really, you know, think learning how to actually understand or read or use code is still important. So you can make sure that you can check that it's actually doing what you expect and it's doing the right thing. So there's still a need for human interaction in coding. Um, all right, we've used lots of functions. Let's talk a little bit more detail about functions. And um, so there's functions that are built in in the base package that don't require any packages to be loaded. And then there's also functions that are within specific packages. We've used STR for structure, we've used class, we've used summary. Uh, and I hinted at um, the mean function. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to um, learn how to use the, a few more of these functions. So inside a function, inside the parentheses or the arguments or the parameters of the function, and sometimes we'll want to specify the names of the parameters or the arguments explicitly, and sometimes we will just let it um, pick it based on the order. So the arguments describe the details of what a function is supposed to do or changes how the function acts. And when giving values to the arguments, now we're going to use an equal sign um, to indicate that we're um, setting a particular value of an argument, not that we're storing something for later use. So let's use the, um, so let's suppose we want to create a vector of 10 zeros. And to do this, we would like to use the rep function. Uh, any guesses on what REP stands for? Replicate or repeat elements of vectors and lists. So we want to repeat x equals 0 uh, 10 times. So this is using the very explicit named arguments. And let's see what happens when we do that. We get 10 zeros. Uh, we can switch the order of the arguments. Here, we're dropping the name of the, um, we're not saying x equals 0, we're just saying 0 but we're still naming the um, 10 times that we want the zeros. Let's see if this still works, and it does. So one argument is named and one argument isn't. It's going based on order. Um, the other argument that we can put into rep um, is the value that we're repeating. And so as long as one of the parameters or arguments is named, that should work out. Um, we don't have to name any of them, and then it just goes based on the order in um, how the function was defined. So x came first and then times. If we switch that and don't have it named, it does not get us what we want. Um, numeric zero. It knows that it's a number, it's supposed to be a number, but it's a number a vector of length zero. Um, and so the zero means there's no length there, there's no objects or any um, values but it knows that it's supposed to be numeric type. All right, so let's do some other functions that are fairly commonly used in statistics. And um, there's going to be some uh, problems here. Uh, before we do that, uh, I wanna bring your attention to these uh, red circles with the white X in them. Um, there are deliberate code problems in here uh, and it's bringing your attention to that. We'll resolve them by the end of this little section here. So first, we're just going to run these one at one at a time. So mean will give you the average of a vector. Um, and actually, we could give it a data frame as long as the whole data frame was um, numbers, and it would give us the average of the whole data frame. That's pretty dangerous unless you really know that uh, everything is numeric. Uh, so now let's, but let's just, we know that weight is supposed to be numbers. So let's try to see what happens if we try to calculate the mean of the weight. We get NA out for not a number or um, nothing, not, uh, not applicable, right? 
Uh, and um, if we think, if we change, or if we look at this variable, I'm gonna take this line of code and I'm gonna turn mean into summary. We looked at this briefly, uh, but now this gives us a little bit more information. It tells us that we do have a lot of numbers in there and we can use this to get the mean, 246.2, um, but there's a lot of NAs in there. And the mean function doesn't know how those NAs are supposed to be handled. So it's just complaining and stopping, it's not going to work. So what we need to do is we need to tell this mean function how to handle the missing values. And um, let's look at the help for mean. And we can see that there's um, three primary um, arguments, the data X, trim, whether or not um, we want to trim any values or a fraction of the observations to be trimmed from each end. So if we want to remove any outlying values and then na.rm. And na.rm is a logical evaluating to true or false, indicating whether any values should be stripped before the computation proceeds. And in here, we can see the default value is false. So by default, uh, missing values are not going to be removed. So we can overwrite that by saying na.rm equals true, all capitals. And now let's see if we can get out 246.2. And we can, and we get a little bit more precision than that summary function. All right, um, median is uh, another function that's used a lot. Let's see what happens when we try to find the median of the species. Warning, argument is not numeric or logical, returning in A. Well, let's see what happens when we look at summary. Characters. Okay. It's probably we're thinking more about the mode rather than the median um, of a character for the species. So instead of median or summary, maybe we can get closer by changing that to table. And now we can look at counts and we can see that the most common is um, RBT. And then brown is the second most column common. Maybe that gets us closer to what we were actually looking for. All right, um, COR. Any guess as to what COR stands for? Correlation. Correlation, very good. Yep, a lot of people want to know the correlation between two. That's 216 question. Correlation is the measure of the linear relationship between two quantitative variables. Okay, so we need two number variables, length and width. Are those numbers? Yes, so we're on the right track. Will it work? No, <laughs> why not? Weight has missing values, right? All right, we know that we know the argument for removing missing values. Na.rm equals true. No, that's not the right one. Okay, we need to stop guessing and we need to actually look up the function. All right, don't get too excited about na.rm. That is an argument, but for var, var would be variance. So co for correlation and covariance, to remove NAs, we actually want to use this use parameter. And we need to go down here a little bit more carefully and read this. Um, an optional character string giving a method for computing covariances in the presence of missing values. This must be an abbreviation of one of the strings, everything, all observations, complete observations, na.or complete or pairwise complete observations. So there's lots of ways that you can remove when you're when you're looking at the correlation. Um, do you want to only look at ones where the 
the pair is complete or do you want um, something a little bit more explicit? Generally, we like to use or I like to use pairwise complete that observation. And if there's an abbreviation of that, um, it will take that and I, I can never remember the abbreviations and so I just write it all the way out. Okay. All right. So sometimes help documentation has more than one function in it, and it's just um, combining related functions together. So you need to be careful and go through the usage and find the one that you're specifically wanting to use, and then look at the parameters or the arguments for that version. Otherwise, we could we would look at bar and stop there, and um, then we would end up with it problems. Okay. Any questions about that? It's about as close as getting into um, statistics um, uh, training that we cover, at least in this this particular workshop. Um, although we are going to talk about cleaning data, so um, we know we've got missing values. We know that we can't really do that much with missing values. Uh, there are more nuanced ways of cleaning the data. Um, that can um, make it, uh, um, sorry, I just had a had a panic that I forgot to unmute myself and I realized I, I'm unmuted. <laughs> I'm sure Samantha, you would have said something. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, we can, if we wanted to be a little bit more nuanced, if we had a lot of um, variables and we wanted to do different kinds of analyses, maybe we'd only want to remove missing values for certain analyses, um, but you can always use a sledgehammer um, when a little screwdriver would work in the sledgehammer in this case is na.omit. And what that is going to do is just completely remove any rows that have any missing values anywhere, right? So that is just the most extreme version of cleaning the data, um, but it will be, uh, it will always work at getting rid of missing values. So for instance, if we look at the dimensions of our original data frame, it's 18,352 by 9. And this is only going to remove rows, right? It's not going to remove columns. And if we want to omit any rows that have any missingness anywhere, we do na.omit. And now our dimension is 16,556 rows and still nine columns. Um, so now let's. Again, we don't want to overwrite our original import in case we want to go back and do something that's a little bit less extreme. So we're going to use this function na.omit, but we're going to store that new clean data frame into a blackfoot fish underscore clean data frame. And now if we go to our environment, we scroll up. Um, now we're going to have two blackfoot fish data frames. Um, one is the full one, and I can move this bar here, and one is the clean one, and it, the clean one has fewer observations. Any questions about that? Now that we have a clean data frame, we can actually visualize it, and Sarah is going to walk you through that. Okay, so we can get the fun part. <laughs> this is our last major coding section of the workshop, so you're getting to the home stretch. Um, so I'm just going to show you a few different types of graphics that you can use to visualize your data. Um, there are scatter plots, distributions, and bar charts. Those are, uh, those are the three. Oh, and we're doing box plots too, that we'll talk about today. So first, um, a scatter plot, maybe you've seen this before. The main purpose of a scatter plot is to show the relationship between two variables across many different cases. So it'll show lots of different dots that kind of show you trends on the data over time. So let's try this. Oh my gosh, I'm a Mac user. There we go. And um, so here you go. You can see each of the data points plotted on here and you have, we're plotting length and weight. So you can see here the scatter plot 
you can just use the variable name and the data we're using is this new clean version of the data. What's set. in between length and width? Oh, this tilde. Yeah. yeah. So this means plot the length by the width. So the length is on the x axis and or sorry, the y axis and the weight is in the x axis here. Does anybody need help finding the tilde? Are you guys up? Oh yeah, good point. Got it. Uh from yeah, it's on it's up by the escape button. Under weeks with um, international keyboards and based on your accents, I think that there's a couple of international students here. The tilde button moves around. Gotcha. Uh, so. <laughs> All right, you will find that tilde. So this is just a very simple way of looking at the data. You can kind of see that most of the fish are between zero and a thousand pounds. And um, in the data visualization workshop, actually, we're about to get to um, bring more detail into this. So if you go below to the next line and run this code that we have here. We're adding more detail. We're like, what here it was like, what is this plot? <laughs> what are these numbers? What does it all mean? So here this gives you a little bit more. We added the label on the x-axis of weight in grams, and we added the the label on the y-axis of length in centimeters. So now you can really see what's going on. So between zero and a thousand grams, and between zero and about four hundred centimeters are where most of our fish are. And then we also um, change the orientation of the x axis label. So one is horizontal, and then if we did two, that would be vertical. You can see those x axis labels are vertical. And then we added a main label for plot of length by weight of <laughs> fish. Fish. There we go. So this now this graph is like much more usable. Someone could glance at it and see what it is. Um, next, let's look at distribution. So a histogram will show how many observations fall into a range of values of a variable, and that can be help. That can be used. You can like visualize the distribution of a single variable. So let's try a histogram of the length of each of these fish. Okay, so we have the length on the x axis and the frequency on the y axis. So that tells us that most of the fish are, no, that, yeah, that 3,500 of the fish are like between, are in this area right below 200 in length. Um, but let's say that instead of the frequency, we want to know the percentage. Mm -hmm. There, if you say frequency is false, you can type this F or you can type out false. Let's try that. Then you're seeing the proportion basically. So this is between, shouldn't this be between zero and one? Well, the, the entire area of those bars will add to one. Gotcha. Okay. So all of this is like 100% of your data set. And so you can see it's about Okay, I'm getting confused. Why, why is this point zero zero four? But it seems like it should be more than that, um, right? If all of this is one, then shouldn't this be like you know? Sixteen thousand. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. Um. Well, I think that there's just a lot that you, that you can't really see. And I guess what we're also showing with this workshop is a lot of this is just sort of looking at the data, seeing what works best, what's it going to explain what you have as well as it can, and what's going to give you the answers that you want. Oh, um, sorry. You have to take the, the height of the bar and then multiply it by the width of the bar, and that would give you an actual... And then, and then add up all the areas of the bars together, and that would give you one. Ah, so uh, gotcha. That's why it's it's probably like uh, with the fifty. So fifty times point zero zero four. I see. Okay. Um. Let's try this next part. If we 
just to here we had said, let's look at the length of the fish and the frequency equals false to make this density graph. What if instead we just say the length of the fish and then false? Let's try that. Okay, we get an error. Greta, your errors are so nice in blue. Mine are red. <laughs> this is a gentle error. <laughs> oh, okay, fine. Okay, Sava. <laughs> um, so click this, sorry. So what we're seeing here is invalid number of breaks. Do you guys have a sense of why that would be? It's a little complicated. Do you, if you have a question about anything that's happening, what would you do? What? Yes. So let's look for the help on histogram. There we go. Okay. Now we're seeing here on histogram, the default is you say X, the, which is for us black fish clean length. Then the next, um, what are these called? Parameter is called would be breaks. And then the third parameter is frequency. So if we don't um, specify what we're talking about when we say false, it's gonna just go in the order that the function is written in. So it's assuming we're talking about breaks um, for this second parameter. But instead we're actually talking about frequency, which in this list is the third parameter. So that's why you need to, if we were, if we did include breaks, then we could just say false. Yeah. So, yeah. What does breaks mean? How it's um, determining how many histograms it's going to do by default and where they're at. Um, so it's about the, the number of bars. In mm. So can we say like a number there? Although it's showing a character. Yeah. Let's try that. So if you scroll down in the help. Sturgis. Oh, I see. Those are different researchers methodologies. For gotcha. Okay. Oh, cool. Right. So breaks, it's saying Sturgis. Let's check it out. Breaks. In the last three cases. Well, okay. Yeah. I don't know, but it didn't work when I did. So, but in any case, now it's knowing that this is frequency because that's the third parameter in the way that the function's written. So we're also trying to show you just some like little quirks of R that you should be aware of. So here, um, making the histogram look nice, we added label, an X label and a label for the graph itself, fish lengths in Blackfoot River, and then some more details. We, if you want to change the number of bins, which are these little bars on the histogram to give you a little more um, granular view, then you can use this n class equals 50, which is here for us under the histogram help down here at the bottom. So if you look down at n class, it should be numeric. And we did 50. You could do 100, and you can see there's more, or you could just do two. <laughs> Not as helpful, but this will change depending on your data. Okay, what time is it? Let's do side by side box plots. This is another type of plot that you can build. And we're using again that tilde, so the weight on the y axis species on the x-axis using our blackfoot fish clean data set. So now you can see this box plot is showing us how many or uh, what the weight of each species is with the main most of the species the bull trout are here in the like 100 grams area and there's some outliers here so it just gives you a different view of what the data is doing. And then last we'll look at bar charts. So this is a way to compare the frequencies of levels of a categorical variable. So for us, let's try section. So first we'll create a table, which we did above, and that gives you the count of each um, of the variables. So in this case, we're making a table of each section. Let's just look at it. 
Okay, so each these are the sections of the river that the fish were found in. So John's Rood and Scotty Brown. So we can see there's 10,000 and 6,000. And then let's build our bar chart. We've used a lot of these different um, like um, graphical customization. So we have the X lit the X axis is labeled with section Y with number of fish. We have the label for the whole graph, and we used this color function, and we used blue. But there's lots of other different colors in R. Oops, you could do yellow if you like. And um, you can look in the help to find other parameters for this. There we go. So, okay. In the next five minutes, let's do a little exercise, graphing exercises. So using statistics or graphics is exercise 11, which year in our data set had the most fish? So you can use one of these graphs that we tried above and see if you can figure out which year had the most fish. Maybe just two minutes on this. And call us over if you need help. Yeah, I mean, in fact, you don't need to use graphics. You could just use a, a simpler thing than that. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it. Maybe I'll give a little. I don't know. Hint. So, oops. What mm -hmm. per year? So if you do, if you use a table, then you can see the counts underneath for each year. So you're seeing, I'd say, and then, so here we are in 1989, 1990, and then you can see the counts below. And then if I want to create a visualization of that, I could use the bar chart. I'm not gonna use the one with labels. Maybe I will. Okay. Just copy what we have above. Oops. Hmm. Sorry. Yeah, User that. error. <laughs> there we go. Do this. Thanks. So we go per year, that's our table that we just made. And our X label will be, I'm not sure yet. So I'm just gonna leave that blank. And then, okay, I think this will, oops. Section. Oh, oh you're right. Oh, you're thanks. Yeah. Okay, here we have, so this is not actually section, that is year, great. Year, and this is number of fish still. Fish caught by year. I don't love that yellow. Is there a pink? Nice. Let's do that. Okay, there we go. And I think we want the limit to be lower. Um, looks like 3,000. Here, so from here, you can just look at the chart and see that the most fish were caught in 2000 in pink. Um, and then exercise 12 is make a box plot. This is a little more straightforward if you go up to the box plot and copy this if you can. Ugh. Control C doesn't work. Control C. 
Are you are you accidentally hitting call speed? I don't think so. Okay, let's see. Maybe I just wasn't being careful enough. Oh, all right, there we go. Fish weights over the years. Okay, so we have weight is going to be on the y axis and years on the x axis. Oops. Oh, year, sorry. There we go. So this will also show you that the weights vary over the years. In 2006, there are a lot of outliers for some reason. Really big fish were caught. So anyway, that's it. This <laughs> That's sort of like um, the main, like just a, the overview of R. And the last little thing we want to tell you about is that if you have fixed all the errors that we had in this file, you should be able to knit or compile it into a file, like an HTML file or a, a Word file or a PDF. Um, and that can be like a way to share your code with people who don't have our studio. You can publish it as an appendix, what have you. And HTML is nice because it can print in a browser. It's very easy. So let's go to, oops, not that. Bye. Nope. To your left. Nope. This one. Oh, knit. I see it with the little knitting needle. Let's knit it. Let's knit it to a PDF. So, uh, no, knit to HTML. Everybody will have what they need to knit to HTML. Okay, so let's do knit. Some additional packages to knit to PDF and to knit to Word. That should always work, but it will only open if you have um, Office installed on your computer. It will create a file that you could then open with Google Docs, <laughs> but it will open automatically. Gotcha. Okay, let's do HTML then. Let's see what happens. I can't tell what's happening. Processing file. Gorgeous. Okay. Actually, it's just published my help text. What is well, this? Um, because the code had a new file. Oh, okay. And it just popped up. Oh, it did. Okay. If you hover over the R. There, yes. there we are. So, one of the main points of using R is that it's open source and that you're documenting all your work. And so, it's a way to share the code that you're creating with your colleagues. And so this is another way of sharing the R code. And then one final thing before we wrap up is exiting R Studio. So when you're done and you want to exit out of R Studio, it'll ask if you want to save your entire workspace. We don't recommend you do this because then all of this madness that's over here will just still be there. We recommend instead that you um, use Command S to save like the RMD file that you have. And you can actually change the options in R so that it doesn't ask you about saving your workspace and their instructions here in the tutorial. But use Command S to save. And then if you want to reload all of this, you know how to do it. You just run all of the code that you already have. So that's our recommendation for as you're headed out. And um, there's a little more information on the bottom about terminology if you have questions about that. And I also want to note that we have a couple more workshops coming up every two weeks. So in two weeks, we'll have intro to Python, which is similar content to this, but in the Python language. And then we'll have data visualization, which gives, um, we'll use ggplot, which is a different package you can install that gives you more options for data visualization. And then data wrangling two weeks after that. And if you access this through the library page or that uh, montana.edu slash data science, then you can access the other workshops there as well. Did I get everything? I think so. Okay, cool. Thanks for coming.